William Henry G, that's my oldest brother. Was my oldest brother. Um, committed suicide three years ago whilst I was in custody. Um, Can we go back to um, what his job was with the cattle and all that stuff? Well, Billy, years ago, was... Um, I'll start from the beginning, yeah, yeah. when it went wrong in his life too. It went wrong in all our lives when we were younger. Billy was the first victim of the um, <clears throat> of the sexual offences that that happened to him. He was taken away from our family at the age of fourteen and went to live with Stephen Armin and that because of the sexual offending that was going on. Um, later on in life, we get back together. He was a great artist; could draw anything. He was around his teenage years when his artistry flowed because of my granddad G on my dad's side at the art shop in Bold Street, a photograph shop, and Billy used to go there every Sunday when he was a kid. And that's where the sexual offences had kicked in. Now we weren't weren't discussing it with no one. We didn't really know what was going on with him until now, hindsight. Um he was getting sex he was getting abused by that side of the family at an early age. Um, he couldn't handle it. He he ended up on drugs, drinking. Had a little but had a little girl, a boy. Moved on. He gets into his late years. He's a few older than me, Billy. So um, he's just looking for work. He ends up getting this job around um, when the cars got that B BSA, um, whatever it was. Billy got a job as one of the persons that was killing the cows. And for his work, he had a catalyzer gun, which is basically a handgun with a bolt that flies out like this. And he had it, he used to take it home and then take it to work with him, do his deed, come back home, whatever. But he's always been dealing with this abuse. And he, he just, he'd always turned to drugs and drinking drugs over it. But anyway, so I'm just doing my thing. I'm about 15, 16. Um, I get a phone call off um, his mate, Ian Rossiter, rubber. I'll call him a dickhead. But fucking, um, he's phoned me and said I'm worried about your brother. He sent me a message saying, um, this is the last time you're going to see Billy G. So I'm just thinking, well, what, what? come and get me then. So he's, he's come round, he's got me. I've got in the car, we've gone to Billy's house, what he was sharing with Kelly and his eldest, little Billy. Um, Knocking on the door, the blinds are closed, knocking on the door, no one's answering. Look through the letterbox, and there's Billy lying on the couch, with um, the gun in his hand, with blood coming out of his head. So, eh. Uh, so, burst it through the door. Kick the door through. Tried to deal with him. Didn't know what to do really, so just rang the, the ambulance. And I don't know why I do this to myself, you know what? It's all right, brother. Let's just take a breath and fucking have a time out. Um, well, anyway, I kick the door in, go through the door. Um, I don't know what to do with him. He's got blood pissing out the side of his head. There's bullets and there's detonators everywhere. I get on the phone, ring the ambulance. The ambulance appear. They sit at the bottom of the street. I'm, I'm screaming on the step, hurry up, get him. They won't come near the door because there's a firearms incident. The, the area needs to be cleared by firearms officers before the ambulance people can go into the, the area. So we're waiting for the firearms coming. We've got history with the police, you all know it. Um, we're waiting for them to come. They come and they sit behind the ambulance. They're not coming up the street to the house to do the clearance. They just sat behind the ambulance. I'm screaming. His girlfriend's on the step. Kelly scream. Everyone's screaming. It is what's going on. He's dying. Why aren't you here doing what you're meant to do? So I just fucked them off. Pick me brother up. I'm only young, me. Pick me brother up. Try and get him into Kelly's car. At that point, they've come up. The ambulance people have took him. 
Um, and that's it, basically. He's in a coma for three and a half months. They said he won't survive. He did survive. Said it was a miracle that he survived. Um, but he come out of that with a form of epilepsy. And he was in a, he's in a bad way off it. Every time he had one of these fits, his mentality had become slower. He'd become a bit more um, vegetative, you know, like in that sort of way. Yeah. So um, we move on. He's not, he should have stayed away from the drugs. He should have stayed away from the drink, but he, he ended up with this other girl who just destroyed his life. The same girl has destroyed another man's life. It's without well, just ignore the girl, but she destroyed my brother's life. Instead of caring for him, she encouraged him to take more drugs. Instead of taking him away from drink, she encouraged him to take more drink. Anyway, he's in that life. He's being damaged. He's gone. He's suicidal right through it. We become a bit more notorious. He's not like us, Billy. He never has. He's never mixed with the group we've mixed. He's always mixed with the other nasty group. So every time we fell out with the group he mixed with, he'd get a hiding because we'd done something wrong by his mates. So his mates would hit him because we'd give his mates cheek. And it, it was just like that. So uh, it comes to the point then where he can't do nothing because we're running mad. We're causing murder throughout the city. Everyone who we used to have a mate now won't speak to him because we're causing murder with them. So he's been coming isolated without us knowing what we're doing. He's becoming more isolated. The only person he's relying on is this poison. Anyway, he's going downhill, he's on the coke, blah, blah, blah. He's got this injury from when he's blasted himself in the head. But he's dealing with it. He can deal with this injury at this moment in time. In 2002, when all the madness was going on, there was an inspector from Merseyside Police called Lowell Carr. Before he became inspector, he was what you call OSD, Operational Support Division. They changed into the Matrix on the back of us, when he put us in jail, he, he started this unit called the Matrix. But before that was called the Oper Operational Support Division, OSD. So this low car has always hated us, always give us a hide and always dragged us in the bus and give us a hide and dropped us off and stuff like this. Always harassed me mum on the streets. No, just horrible, nasty policeman. But anyway, he promoted him, so he got, him up, got himself to inspector. Uh, Whatever they've been, they've had, they've had enough of us. Merseyside police have had enough of us. They went rogue. I think there's, there's a policeman's admitted that they broke laws to contain us and deal with us. But what, in that process, they've gone through my mum's door um, for firearms and drugs. We don't live there. We haven't lived there for time. Billy doesn't live there, but he's staying there this night. Now, they've targeted Billy at the address. We know that. It all came out in the court case. Now, what's happened is... Um, the briefing before they've raided my mum's house, there's been a journalist there from the Liverpool Echo, and he was told in that meeting, the target on this raid is Billy G. So they went to the house to target Billy G. Don't know how they knew he was in there, because he never only stayed there. So as you go to my mum's house, you've got a front door, you've got stairs, you've got a little back bedroom, and that's where Billy used to stay. So they've, they've done the briefing, they've come to the house, the photographer's there taking snots, blah, blah, blah. They've gone through the door, they've gone upstairs. Billy's lying down asleep. He'd been drinking the night before, and as he did, he'd been lying down asleep like that on the bed. They've opened the door and attacked him. Now, the first, the first, the first attack penetrated where he shot himself in the head. So, straight away, he's gone into an epileptic fit. Um, but they've opened his wound again, what had re repaired, and he weren't that bad off. He had, he had a few problems, but what they'd done that night mm. killed him, destroyed him, finished him, gave him worse symptoms. But anyway, they've gone through the door. They've gone through the door. They've attacked Billy with the koshers. Um, they've done what they've done. They've put a, a quarter ounce of cocaine on him. They've put two bullets, and they've put a big knife about this big on him. Dragged them out. As they're dragging them out, you've got the Liverpool Echo <coughs> taking pictures of them. You've got him with low car dragging him out. He's got blood dripping down him. Um, they arrest him for attempted murder on police, possession of firearms with intent to supply, all this, blah, blah, blah. Take him in custody. He's in a mess, you know, mentally and physically. He's in a mess from when he shot himself. He shouldn't be getting treated like this. They treated him the way they'd done him. It was complete stitch up. 
it was a complete stitch up and it all got found out. I'm going to tell you how it got found out. They've done that, they've arrested them, they've put them in custody for nine months. In custody, he's having these fits, he's going under. He, it is what it is. They, they terrored him in a bad way. Um, we know Billy's not that character. We know Billy's not the kid to jump off a bed and attack a policeman with a knife. He's just never been like us. He's never been like us. So I'm questioning this, I'm going, tch, tch, tch. he's saying he hasn't done it. Let's get our own forensics done on the room before anything kicks in. So straight away, as soon as the police have left, we've got solicitors in, we've got the ballistics in. The ballistics have come back. What the police are saying in their allegation is this. They've raided the house. They've gone up the stairs. When they've gone into the back bedroom, Billy's standing there with his top off with a, with a knife and he starts attacking a police officer with the knife. So they've, they've got to restrain him. That's how he's got the 12-inch scar on the back of his head off the beating. Yeah, he's got two of them. He had a 12-inch and a 7-inch where they've assaulted him. So um, they're... they're their story was they went in, they've raided it, Billy's attacked one of them with the, with the shiv, tried to stab the copper up, they've restrained them, the damage has happened, Jordan restrained it, in the process of the search they've come across the cocaine and the things in the same room that Billy was in, blah blah blah, as they took him out the house, you've got the, you've got the pictures getting took by the photographer, he goes into the custody seat, he goes, bam, okay, everyone's believing you, that's the case, but we're not, and we want to find out if it's the truth, so the ballistics come in, and the ballistics completely contradict what their ballistics said. So their ballistics said, yeah, it all makes sense that he was standing up and Billy's attack with and da da da. But our independent ballistics from a from a team in Glasgow somewhere um, said, no, the first contact or assault or where the batons are being used have been on the bed. We can tell that Billy was lying down on the bed with his head on the pillar that way by the way the blood has splattered off his head and gone off the wall. The police couldn't see it, but when the ballistics have gone in there, you've got to, when they first hit him on the back of the head and went, wham, you've got to spray up the wall. So straight away, that's given us the authority to dig deeper on this. So we want the custody suite. We want the cameras out the custody suite, how he's treating him when he's coming to the custody suite. So the copper that's dragging him out the house and dragging him into the custody suite and the one that's making the allegation that he's being stabbed in the vest, as they walk into the custody suite, the copper walks away. When he comes back into the custody suite, he's holding his vest like this. And then when he moves his hands away, you can see stab wounds on his vest. You know, as if, as if it's like Billy had started to stab him in his vest, not to coincide with the story. So we went, okay then, but we don't believe this has happened. We want all photos from the bedroom from when he's come out the house off this journalist, from when he's been, so every photo we want, we want to see them. He's refused. The police have refused to hand them over. The journalist is refusing after all that. We had to go to court. We won the court ruling. The judges ordered the journalist from the Liverpool Echo to give every photograph taken about that day. We've got them. The copper that's got the stab wounds in his vest, in the custody suit, hasn't got them coming out the house when they're restraining Billy. So they're dragging Billy out of the house like they stabbed him, but the copper who's now got stab wounds on his vest in the custody suite hasn't got them coming out the house when he's restraining Billy. So there you go, the case is proven. You've set Billy up, you've sunk him, and you've damaged him. They didn't want to... The next day, listen to this, this is how corrupt they are. The next day after they battered Billy in the bedroom, and he's still in hospital, he hasn't even touched the court or the jail system yet, he's still fucked in hospital while all this is going on, He's not even charged, but you've got the inspector of Merseyside Police walking round the street with a Liverpool Echo paperboy bag over his shoulder, pushing papers through everyone's door with Billy like that, fucked, covered in blood. And it was corrupt. It weren't real. It was all false. It was all fake. And it was just dirty what they'd done to me, brother. Because on the back of that trauma, on the back of him going to jail, on the back of... He, he's never, ever recovered. He come, on, he come out the back of that assault with the worst epilepsy. So when he shot himself in the head, he had, he had a form of epilepsy that he can contain. When these have done this damage to him, he had a form of epilepsy where he vaulted off the bed. Like, he'd go stab and vault off the bed, bite his, bite his cheeks open, bite his, rip his tongue open of a night. Jesus. This is what Billy was going through. 
So every time, every time he'd go through one of them episodes, his mind would deteriorate, his mental capacity would deteriorate. And when I look back at photos now, as I do all the time, could have missed him badly on it. So I look back at the photos and you can see him mm. like becoming more like Mong like, mm. like Down syndrome looking. So anyway, I think he knew that. And I, I don't think he wanted his kids to see him like that. Yeah. Like their last image. I don't think they wanted, I don't think Billy wanted their last image of their dad looking like that. Mm. And I think it was just, his girl pushed him over at the edge eight weeks before, eight weeks before he, he kills himself in my mum's house. No one's loving him. I'm in jail, I can't love him. I'm stuck, I can't really do nothing. So um, everyone who's around him just can't deal with him because he's a mental illness and he's drinking too much and he's always causing trouble, but no one's loving him properly. He's not getting the love he deserved. So 12 weeks before this has gone on, he's been stabbed in the chest by his girl, by this monster girlfriend. She stabbed him in the chest. Um, she went to kill him, basically. She's known for it. So she stabbed him in the chest. Police have come. Billy being the man he is, he's turned around and said to them, I've stabbed myself in the chest. So the kids didn't get taken away. Because as soon as he would have said that monster had stabbed him, the kids get taken into care. So to prevent that, Billy said, I've stabbed myself in the chest and got sectioned. The police sectioned him on that. He comes out of that and within three months he's hung himself. Oh, Jesus, man. Now I'm in jail while this is kicking and so it's hard for me to deal with him and I haven't really grieved. So at the beginning of my sentence, I'm on remand. And my dad, piss head, battered us, didn't really matter. He's fell down the stairs, he's had an epileptic fit. Obviously, I want to go to the funeral just to see my family, basically. Not to not for him, just to get out and be around my family a little bit. Uh, they refused it on the grounds that it was a security risk um, and they were concerned about the safety of their officers. So that was in 2004. So we go back to 2016 when I'm, I've done my sentence, done an 18 year sentence. They wouldn't give me a DCAT, they wouldn't give me parole. Um, I applied to go to my brother's funeral. They refuse on the grounds that I'm an escape risk and the safety of their officers. I've got 22 weeks left off an 18 year sentence. I've never tried to escape. I've never been in Nick with a phone. Um, they said this team, Titan from Manchester, it's a police organization that combats Northwest crime groups. Titan refused me to go to this, uh, to my brother's funeral. It is what it is, lad, but they've done it to harm me. Not for no security reasons, not for none of this. It is what it is. That's Billy. He's passed now. He's left three lovely kids. Basically, his death just broke our family to pieces. It just ripped everyone apart, and we haven't recovered off it. So the cops who went in and came out clearly, and there was no stab wounds, right, so were any of them held responsible? They were all well held responsible. You had policemen sacked, who are now back in the force ten years later. The same policemen. You had people. You had policemen moved out of the area. You had log car and people like that just reprimanded, demoted and but then on the other hand, when I've been arrested, the same group of coppers, some of them have been promoted and some of them have been, you know, well done. But what they don't tell you is they settled out of court on that case with Billy and given forty eight thousand pounds to not make it public. They also done it to me, Danny, Stephen and Ian. We all got money off the police for their behaviour in two thousand and four. On my case, the same group of police were stitching us up bad. Um, they've, they've got me, little Craig Barker, Mark Richardson, we're all in a the car. These are coming to stitch us, this Gary Doolan and all this. They follow us into my mother's estate and just attack him. Attack him and then come for me. I get out the car, knowing I've got a camera. Put my hands in my pocket, stand there. They just come at me and floor me, dance all over me and then arrest me. Take me into the custody, not knowing I've got CCTV, that contradicts everything they're saying. They're saying that they believe I've had a gun in the passenger seat and that's why they've come after me in the first place. So they've nicked me, they've charged me with conspiracy to possess firearms, threats to kill and blackmail with firearms. But the CCTV footage come out and it contradicted them completely. 
just showed they were lying. There was no one coming from us in, in what they said. They'd all colluded. The four officers at the scene had colluded and perverted the course of justice. And they were found guilty for it. Nothing happened to them. They were just demoted. I got 22 grand off them. But it never went in the paper. They just get a slap on the wrist. But they're just some of the incidents. That's not all of it. There's tons, I know. All right, so the people watching this now, more than half the viewers are out of America. They're thinking, who is this guy with the accent like the Beatles? 